Today on Government Matters, the Pentagon's cyber rules aren't just for the Pentagon anymore. One of the top IT leaders at the General Services Administration tells you why. The administration gives up on its plan to merge the Office of Personnel Management into GSA, but the management challenges at OPM haven't gone away. An inside look from the agency's Inspector General's office. And growing the next generation of soft power. One of the leaders of the Pentagon's effort to work with America's allies explains how her unit's doing it. Government Matters starts right now. From Washington, D.C. and around the world, this is Government Matters with Francis Rose. Thanks for watching the weekend edition of Government Matters, the only show covering the latest news, trends, and topics that matter to the business of government. I'm your host, Francis Rose. The Defense Department's Cybersecurity Maturity Model certification requirements will be in the new Polaris Small Business Government-Wide Contract. It's the second major contract vehicle where the General Services Administration has used the CMMC requirements. Keith Nakasone is Deputy Assistant Commissioner for Acquisition at the Office of the IT category at the General Services Administration. Keith, welcome. Thanks very much for coming on. Why is GSA adding the CMMC requirements to these contracts, Keith? Uh, thanks, Francis. Thanks for the question. W one of the reasons why we're we're doing this is D uh, Department of Defense is one of our major customers against our government-wide acquisition contracts. Uh, in addition to that, we we want to make sure that the um, contracts are within scope so that people understand we can educate the the um, uh, industry partners that are leveraging our contract as. Um, or actually going after our contracts would be able to compete in that space as well. Are you worried that there are some companies that may decide not to bid, not to participate because they're not equipped or don't feel like they can compete, uh, that they can get themselves qualified under the CMMC requirements to get on these contracts, Keith? Uh, great question. Uh, so, so the way we're building out the uh, government-wide acquisition contracts is that we're we're layering it in, meaning that um, it's not a firm requirement within the uh, uh, government-wide contracts, but it is available to be within scope. So, what I mean by that is, the language is in the uh, master contract, but it will be. Uh, order specific, meaning that if a uh, Department of Defense customer comes to us, we would be able to incorporate that language into the contract so that uh, at the order level, so that we can comply with the DOD requirements at the different levels within CMMC. So if I'm a company that doesn't expect to do business with the Defense Department, I don't have to feel like I'm going to be shut out of doing business with the the agencies that I normally do business with because I either am not able to comply with this or don't choose to comply with this, Keith. Am I hearing you right? Uh, absolutely. So so when we talk about the government-wide acquisition contracts, it will still be available for the civilian agencies to use. And again, at the order level, it will be um, incorporated if the civilian agencies choose to use the, the CMMC program or not. So it will have that flexibility. So if I'm, if, again, I know this is all speculation, but I imagine there are companies that are in these various positions, Keith, and are wondering how this will apply to them. If I am one of these companies that says, you know what, maybe I do want to make myself eligible for this. Is there a role for GSA to help them navigate the CMMC uh, process, or is that going to be on the Defense Department? And should those companies look to the Defense Department to help them understand what they need to do and how to get in that process? Great, thanks. Uh, great question. We're uh, we're definitely in partnership with the Department of Defense. We're working alongside them. So where we can benefit and add value, educate, train, uh, raise that awareness for the program and, and the implementation, over time we will be able to um, help uh, facilitate and also educate the um, private industry partners as well through through this process that we, and engagement that we're working with the Department of Defense. There is a concern that eventually this will become part of all of the contracts that GSA writes. Do you foresee a time where that's the case, Keith? Or do you foresee that there are some contracts where CMMC requirements won't be necessary, specifically IT contracts, obviously? 
again, we're in the very early stages in the process. So we have to go through the evaluation, the assessment, and understand the ramifications as we go through the IT contracts, as well as understanding the framework and working with the Department of Defense, as well as our civilian agencies. So um, in time, we will be um, uh, evaluating, assessing, and then responding to, to the needs that come forward. I know this is still very new and that you're working through a lot of these uh, processes. Are you hearing yet from your vendor community uh, about any concerns that they might have, maybe that are different than the things I've asked you about, Keith? Um, for the most part, I think you're, you're spot on. A, a lot of the activities and, uh, or engagements that we're having have been brought to uh, our attention, and we're going to be working alongside with the Department of Defense to work through any of those issues, um, as well as to um, gain the momentum to support the, the uh, CMMC efforts uh, moving forward. Um, but. Like I said, we're going to be addressing this as we uh, dive, take a deeper dive into this. We're using nonprofit organizations to help that private public engagement to help better understand um, from a small, medium, large business uh, the different frame, frame of references that they may have for CMMC. We just have a minute or so left, Keith. Um, FCW reported not long ago that the draft RFP for Polaris uh, most likely coming out in December. Anything changing that timeline between then and now? We're still targeting for that that time frame. What else should people be paying attention to? What else should the vendor community pay attention to, either specifically in these two vehicles where you've already included CMMC or in things that might be coming out in the future? From, from an acquisition standpoint, I think um, being aware that we're actually injecting the emerging technologies focus in, in, as well as the socioeconomic programs uh, uh, initiatives that we have within our portfolio, but we, we definitely want to um, focus on the innovations. We want to focus on implementing the contract with the flexibility of moving forward with with our IT infrastructure modernization efforts. Keith Nakasoni of GSA, it's great to have you. Thanks for coming on the program. Thanks for having me. Up next, the big management problems at the Office of Personnel Management. Straight ahead on Government Matters, the biggest challenges the agency faces and how to fix them. You're watching ABC7. The merger of the Office of Personnel Management into the General Services Administration is off, but OPM still has major management problems to deal with. IT and money are among them. Michael Esser is Assistant Inspector General for Audits at OPM. Michael, welcome. Thanks for coming on the program. You list four key challenges in this new work on OPM's management challenges. The first is a shortfall in OPM funding. I don't think that's surprising to anybody that's been tracking the agency over the years, but what is the implications specifically that you're looking at regarding money at OPM? So first of all, thanks for having me, Francis. Uh, the, the shortfall in funding that we identified is uh, related partially to the transfer of the background investigations function from OPM to DOD uh, in FY20. That led to a shortfall last year of approximately $70 million that OPM was able to make up by a buyback of services that DOD bought back from OPM, as well as an additional appropriation. But in FY21, the, the same issue exists going forward. And, and what we believe is necessary for OPM to do is, is put together a comprehensive budget request that, that certainly covers all of the areas that that OPM needs to need, needs to fund appropriately, and work with OMB and Congress to get that that approved. The the part that relates to the GSA merger that you mentioned is a a a, a movement that was taken a place to. Uh, take away the delegation of authority to operate the uh, TRB, the Teddy Roosevelt building that OPM occupies, move that back to GSA. Now, if, if there was gonna be a merger, that might've made sense, but without a merger, 
what that does is create the problem in funding because of the cost of eliminating that delegation related to the need to eliminate some of the contracts that are in place. And if GSA takes over the building, the estimate is that there's going to be an increase in annual costs of about $4 million a year. So, so there's, you know, it's not a done deal. There's, there's, it's been extended for a year, but uh, it's something that we're keeping our eye on. The second item on your list, Mike, is the financial integrity of OPM's trust fund. Is there a connection there between the trust funds and the overall budget issues at OPM, or are they running on separate tracks? Oh, well, there's certainly some connection because there's there's areas of that that trust fund management that OPM is responsible for that OPM has projects that they would like to implement, put in place that they can't because of funding. Uh, you know, one example of that would be an issue related to the eligibility of enrollees in the FEHBP. There are, there are fraudulent instances that, that we've identified of ineligible enrollees uh, and it's certainly an issue because of the process that's used for enrolling. There's there's self certification of uh, marriage and 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 children and and so forth. A central enrollment system would be a much it would be a much improved process over what is in place now. OPM has a plan to do that. However, the funding has not been approved to, to move forward with that, so it's, it's an issue there as well. And I imagine that building a system like that becomes an IT challenge, which is the third item on your list. I don't think anybody watching this program isn't aware that OPM's had challenges, the biggest one obviously in 2015. Is it your sense that the IT challenges at OPM are getting worse or just not improving sufficiently quickly enough? No, we don't think they're getting worse. I mean, I think since the, the breaches in 2015, there's certainly been significant movement forward and, and progress in, in securing data at OPM and, and improving the, the, the processes that are used over IT security. So that, that's, that's been a good thing that's happened at OPM. But what, we're, what we have now is a situation where the funding for the, the CIO office, for example, has been uh, less than it needs to be over the years. And, and there's what's commonly called an IT deficit in terms of getting to where OPM really needs to be just to be at a, a standard modern baseline of functionality of the IT systems. And it's just been, you know, caused by a, a historical underfunding of, of the program. Uh, so, so that affects not only the CIO office in terms of projects that need to be uh, implemented at OPM, uh, staffing in the CIO office, but also projects in other OPM programs, such as the retirement program that is working a lot of their processes on, on legacy systems that are very old. We have a little bit more than a minute left. The fourth item on your list is government-wide challenges. What does that term mean, Mike? Well, we, we kind of use that to just identify challenges that, that OPM is responsible for, but really impact agencies across government. And and one of, one of the challenges that we list in this year's report is uh, identifying the skills gap and and moving forward to mitigate skills gaps in in key function areas across government um, it's, it's something that there's a lot of data that OPM can take advantage of and just needs to do a little better job of doing that we have about 30 seconds left you said at the beginning of our conversation one of the things that OPM lacks is a comprehensive or should produce is a comprehensive budget request and I wonder if you're, you, you mean to say that they don't have one now and that's why they need one. Well, I think they just need to do a little better job of, of planning ahead. For example, the, the funding shortfall that, that hit when NBIB, the, the background investigations function, moved to DOD, seemed to be something that, that OPM wasn't totally ready to address with OMB and, and Congress. Mike Esther, thank you very much for joining me. It's great to have you on the program. Thank you.
Up next, training the people that build America's partnerships around the world. Straight ahead on Government Matters, a new track to build America's soft power. You're watching ABC7. The Defense Security Cooperation University celebrating its one-year anniversary. Members of the Security Cooperation Workforce have already completed more than 25,000 coursework. Kara Abercrombie is president of the Defense Security Cooperation University. Kara, welcome. It's good to see you again. What have you learned over the past year, and how have you applied it, and how have the people who have gone through your coursework applied it in the security cooperation community in DOD? Oh, thank you, Francis me back on the program. We are very excited that we've passed the one-year milestone. Um, this first year has been something of a trial period uh, as we built out a curriculum to train and certify the security cooperation workforce, which, um, as you know, numbers upwards of 20,000 military and civilian uh, um, officials in the, in the Defense Department. So what we've learned this year was, number one, Good to plan to be flexible. Um, we had upgraded our learning management system to enable distance learning, which came in, to, it came in extremely handy when we transitioned to 100% virtual learning in the first year. Um, we've also engaged the stakeholders um, across the department to understand what they need. And we've been incorporating that into our curriculum. And candidly, we've even um, made some minor adjustments to the certification program that will go into effect come January based on feedback we've gotten from the first year. What did you learn in that process that will manifest itself differently? How will the coursework look different when you go through those changes than it did when you stood it up? Sure, I think we had envisioned all along having some form of hybrid online pre-coursework with in-residence training. Look, I think there's no going back to only in-residence training. We have found that there is a huge demand for the online learning, particularly for our military members who serve in embassies overseas. We have found this to be an extremely successful model, bringing them together in a virtual learning environment. And so I anticipate you will see that continuing into the future, in addition, of course, to the, the in-residence portion. Uh, the other feedback we've gotten is security cooperation is such an important tool for the Department of Defense in engaging our foreign uh, allies and partners. We really needed to focus in on establishing um, not just the certification levels for career members of the workforce. We had looked at basic, intermediate, advanced, and we'd even looked at creating an expert level of certification. But what we found is we really need an executive certifi certification um, aspect to address the needs of the leadership in the department, uh, whether it's the general and flag officers, the, the career and political SESs. We've built out um, a very robust executive training program now that we are um, delivering online. You have called uh, 2020 a transition year for the effort that you're undertaking. What does 2021 look like? Does that transition continue because of COVID, because of the remote work environment that we're all dealing with or something, some other reason? Or is 2021, do you think, the year that you can really hit the gas pedal and start to experience the maturity of your organization? I, I like that metaphor, a gas pedal it is. No, we are ready. Um, this has been a very productive year for us despite the pandemic. And so we are ready to, uh, we will have a defense department instruction coming out at the end of this year. And for those of you who know, that is the official policy document uh, that will institutionalize our certification program. So come January, if you are occupying a security cooperation position, you will need to become certified. And so that's what we look to do next year, um, as well as build out the final uh, courses required for the certification program. What does the feedback loop look like or sound like, Kara, that you make sure that the coursework that you're providing is valuable to these people when they actually either continue in the jobs that they're doing or move into the jobs that they're certified for, rather than just being a compliance exercise, you have to have this piece of paper, so you have to go take this class. 
Absolutely, that's a great question. We, our number one goal, candidly, is to provide value to the community. And if we're not doing that, then we're not doing our job. So we've built in a number of formal and informal feedback mechanisms. We have established a governance body, the senior um, steering board, which brings together leaders of the military departments and defense agencies who are, and combatant commands who are participating in the program. That's one way we meet at least annually, and they are giving us substantive feedback. We've also got uh, at the lower level regular check-ins um, that have proceeded in this virtual environment where we accept feedback on the program structure as well as curriculum. And then of course, there's always the feedback that our faculty receive and they are ready and able to um, make modifications you know, instantly uh, for the next course based on student feedback. And that student feedback was what I wanted to follow up on. Do you have or do you plan to have a framework in place to follow up with these students six months, a year, two years out to be able to give them a chance to say, I learned this, that was helpful. I wish I could have learned this also. Absolutely, yes. I mean, another goal of ours is to really foster a sense of community among security cooperation professionals. And we will be doing that through the university, uh, through regular touch points with alumni. Um, we will be creating um, abilities to network online, reach reach back opportunities for students to consult our faculty experts on sticky problems, as well as creating fora for them to collaborate amongst themselves. Again, this is a whole new world. This is a paradigm shift in how we engage and learn, and, and we're ready, we are ready to meet that demand. About 30 seconds left, Kara. In the standing up process, what have you learned that you would do differently if you were starting over? Oh, my. Um, <laughs> Communicate, 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 uh, which we knew, but you could never communicate enough. Kara Abercrombie, it's great to have you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Francis. Don't forget, if you miss an episode of Government Matters, you can find it on our website, govmatters.tv, and you get a preview of every newscast by signing up for our daily program guide. You just text GOVMATTERS to the number 22828. I'm back in two minutes. That's the latest from Washington. Join me weeknights at 8 and 11 on WJLA 24-7 News and next Sunday morning at 1030 on ABC 7. Stay plugged in on issues that matter to the business of government. Thanks for watching. I'm Francis Rose.